So, glory to God. It's good to see you guys this a.m. What do you guys want to talk about? I don't know. But nobody ever prepares in advance for their question. <laughs> I can tell you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sometimes Joe does. Actually, I... <laughs> <laughs> there, we go. Something. there we go. All right. Uh, I mean, I, we don't have to talk about this whole time, but I was thinking about this actually the other day is um, feeling that you're not doing enough and not in a sense of not doing enough for God, but just like, okay, actually, I don't want to talk about that. I want, no, I this is actually, this, this is, uh, I want to talk about that. Okay. We can talk about that one. The other one I do actually want to talk about, and maybe because this is now, now that I'm a dad, is uh, sometimes it is a scary thought that there will be a day that I won't be here anymore for him. And in, and it's not like uh, like I worry about him, but just like that saddens me. That there will be a day that he'll just be by himself and he won't be with his dad anymore. But he'll obviously have the dad of God. So I don't know which one you want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, so sure. I, I, I don't want to assume anything, but after having that thought, you're able, you're able to differentiate it, right? So it's the it's second one, one? The... Well, all of them. Oh, okay. Okay, right? Like, so we'll get back to the first one. Okay. Um, but if I'm, if I'm posed with the idea of am I doing enough, you have to first determine what is it you're supposed to be doing, yeah. right? You can't just run with that thought just out there, right? You have to first have something you're weighing it by, and if you're not weighing it with anything, then that's one of the reasons why that thought would come to you. So you have to first know what is it I'm supposed to be doing in order to even think about that thought. Um, but with your, your son, so there's a difference between feeling uh, a sadness that there could be a small period of time where you're not physically with your son, right? And the weight of that feeling, that thought, from the perspective of mortality, right? What I mean, a temporal life, right? There's a difference between that feeling you can feel and then judging life by it, right? So am I just feeling that or am I now establishing conclusions, right? Because then what you went on to say is that he'll be alone. Well, that's a lie. Okay. If mm -hmm. he, he's never alone. Right. Right, so even that type of reasoning it, there's nothing wrong with having the thought. It's not like, oh, I'm a dirty sinner. I got to get rid of that thought. It's not, we don't have to try to prevent ourselves from having the thoughts, but when they come, we want to weigh those thoughts in the balance with God. They can tell. Right? And, and realize what you're feeling actually is the weight of a temporal life. Like James, I think, says that all fla flesh is as the flower of the grass. It fades away. Right? And so all those thoughts you're having are born from a temporal life. They're born from a perishable life. None of them are born from God or from the power of an indestructible life. And so, of course, we're going to have those thoughts because we have a life that's outside of time. But our, our physical being right now is definitely within this world that's within time. And so we can feel the weight of temporality. If I don't know if Gary Venturello, <laughs> is that a word on this? You might know too. Temporality? <laughs> no. Okay. I, I'm, I, I can I create a. What you're looking for is time. I could create a whole nother language. <laughs> yes, 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 right? So, but that's consistent with Louisiana because we're big on slang. Yes. You, you want to recognize why that thought comes to you, right? And then what happens is, is you connect with the truth in the presence of having that thought, right? Immediately, what I would start doing is the truth would come in, and I would start thanking God that He's my my son's father. And that even if there's a, a small period of time, because really, if we're looking at the grand scheme of things, the, the amount of time that you would be physically separated from your son isn't even a hundredth of a second. It isn't even that long, right? Mm. In, in the grand scheme of eternity, it's not even that long. And, and so if you're feeling that, the, the connection we make when we feel those things is we connect with what's true, which is God. We connect with God is our father we connect with the life that we have from god right we connect with the truth that your son could never be alone that the thing you're actually desiring for him and you being there is your desire for him to be protected you're designed for him to be cared for you're designed for him to have a friend you're desiring for him to not know he's not alone well he's got all that in god and so what you would do is your desire would be discerned 
And now you would start talking to God about the fulfillment of your desire in him, right? And how he'll be with your son and how your son will never be alone and how you this one thing you'll know that you'll see God inside of your flesh and your son will see God inside of his flesh and you'll walk with him all the days of your life, right? And the thing you'll spend your life teaching him is about God, God with him, the testimony God's given in the person of Jesus Christ so that he can know he's not alone, right? right? Because you trailed your thought with, I don't want him to be alone, right? Well, that kind of a thought comes from God. God also didn't want us to be alone. And so he did something so we would know we were never alone. Even Jesus, when he was leaving, he said, I'm going to be with my father. Those dudes are all stressed out. Why were they stressed out? Because they were thinking they're going to be alone. Human does not like being alone. Unless you're me, maybe. I could live off in a cave by myself probably for a while. But you wouldn't be alone. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't even see what I'm going to be But that... that that desire comes from God. And so you would start connecting with God and committing that desire and those thoughts into the hands of God, communing with God, communing around the truth, right? Does that make any sense? Like when we left Colorado, Becky and I could not wait to get out of there. Seriously, by the time it got to the end, we were like, we're dying here. It was like a piece of hell. And people were like, what? Well, we were there for like 15, 16 years. I skied every slope that could be skied. I skied every out-of-bounds slope that could be skied repetitively. I did every hike. I hiked all the 14ers. I did all of it. Whitewater, right? I did all of it. I sucked the marrow out of that thing. We camped it at Rollins Pass and, and, you know, the Royal Gore. I mean, we did all that stuff. And Colorado is beautiful, but it lacks culture. It lacks music. It lacks flavor. It, the food is bland. It just... It's not Louisiana. It's great to go, and it's great to leave. Well, by the time we left, I was like, hallelujah. But I'm telling you, when we, and we can all feel this, it's like time, the presence of time, sentimentality, right? As we were leaving, I felt this empty, empty feeling in my stomach, right? And it was like the unknown. It was like, what are we doing? It was so empty that literally I felt like, somebody gut punched me and the air just got sucked out of me even though I knew I heard from God even though I couldn't wait to get out of there even though I knew all that my mortal body could feel this thing and when we were leaving there was like this whole chapter of our life is just flipped right like that right we just spent 15 years there we met there we dated there we we were married while we were in Colorado we bought our first we did all these things and it's like you feel the weight of a thing coming to an end and you can feel it Right? So that's the kind of thing all of us can feel. Doesn't matter how much you believe, doesn't matter how much faith you have. And the reason we feel it is because we're still inside of time, and our bodies are inside of time, and our bodies haven't been glorified yet. So they can feel the weight of time, right? Or things that we perceive within time. And so even when you think about your son being alone, you're perceiving that within time. You're not perceiving it within eternity. And that that weight can make you feel something, right? But then when we feel it, we, we're, we're not like the unbelievers that don't know God, right? We, we're those that know the truth. So in the middle of that, we know where we're coming. We, we're crying out Abba. When I say Abba, I, I don't just mean like we just say those words. I'm talking about a dynamic in your heart where the spirit of the sun's been poured out into us. And when we encounter these things, these weights, the, the, the things that so easily beset us, right? The lack that can press in on us and the things that we do to try to satisfy the lack. We know the truth. And so in that place, we can start connecting with God and finding ourselves um, reassured, finding our fears sent away from us, finding the lack sent away from us. We can find a confidence come alive inside of us where the thought of, my son will be alone, will quickly turn into, thank you, Father, that he can never be alone. Mm. Right? And a confidence becomes born in you. And you start living from that confidence. Right. A lot of it has to do with your perspective, Glenn, you know? Like, how much you're doing if you're doing enough, right? We, if you ask your wife, you ain't never do enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I'm not talking about your particular wife. Maybe you do need to see every, every wife. <laughs> every wife, you're not doing this, okay? 
<laughs> but uh, if, you know, if you're looking at from another, that's an unrighteous judgment. Yeah, right. Oh, that is not necessary. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but if you're looking from, uh, you know, another perspective, it can be completely different. You know. So the right. So does that make sense? What I'm talking about with the feeling? Yeah, it was. It was more along the lines of like. Um, kind of understanding God's love for Jesus, you know, I have this unconditional love that I just never, ex never knew or felt existed until I had my son. And then to think that kind of in the same way God loves us, it's like, man, that's crazy that one day there will be a time where he will be, again, me thinking he'll be alone, but in reality he won't. That's right. because I know that I have God, even though my um, you know, the father that I have on this earth is separated from me, but we, but I know that, I, and it's essentially, I'm not alone because I do have the father that always loves me no matter what. Yeah. And you were never alone. And Jesus was never alone. Good. Right. And the father would have never looked at Jesus and thought he's going to be alone. Right. When, right. when, when Jesus was putting on a skin suit and being born of Mary, the father and the spirit weren't thinking, well, he's going to be alone for a while. That they weren't thinking that, right? And so the, it's a sentimentality. We can feel that thought, but then we just process it with God, with the truth. We mix that thought with the faith that was revealed in Jesus. I, I, I spend a lot of time trying to help people see that, right? That, and that gets into what what's our part, right? Am I doing enough? I spend a lot of time trying to connect people to do that. We spent so many years in the gospel with religion being beat over our head and all the things we were told we need to do to get God to move, to get God to love us, to get God to be there for us, to get God to be God. I mean, we lived our lives being told what we need to do to get God to be God, as if God could ever be anything other than God, right? And so we stripped all that away. And there can be a period of time where you just feel out there, right? Through the course of all that, I don't know if you guys realize, I've consistently tried to mix in the role that we play. Right? Because it's not that we don't play a role. I mean, God is God and he's always being God. But how do I commune with God? Right? How am I engaged with God that's always being God? Right? How am I connecting with his love? How am I communing with the love of God? And the way that we commune with the love of God, you could say it a bunch of different ways. We commune with the love of God through the hearing of faith. Right? Through the continuous looking into the work that he's done in Jesus Christ through the continuous looking into the life that was manifested in Jesus Christ, which is the life of God that he has poured out on us, right? We hear the faith. We hear about his work. We hear about the life he has in himself. We hear how he conquered death in the flesh. We hear how he's delivered our lives from the corruption that's in the world, how he's liberated us from this world. Our lives are no longer held in this world. There was an exodus from Egypt right? When God led the children of Israel out of Egypt by the lamb he provided, he delivered them from the death of Egypt. Well, there's been a greater exodus for all of us. And what God's done through the person of Jesus Christ to provide himself as the lamb, God shed his own blood to liberate our lives from being held in this world and to begot our lives again from an incorruptible seed, the seed of his life. And he's done all those things, right? And he's poured himself out for us. And the way we commune with his love is we commune, we hear about what he's done and the life that he has. And we talk about it and we weigh it in the balance and we minister it to one another as we walk through good times and as we walk through bad times. That's what we do. That's how we fellowship with it. That's what keeps us in the love of God. That's what keeps us feeling fully embraced by God or being persuaded that we're fully embraced by God instead of getting to the place where we, we feel like we've lost the loving feeling, <laughs> right? You've lost the loving feeling, right? Well, listen, the world is always trying to take us to the place where we've lost the loving feeling, where we have this idea in our head, God loves us. Well, I know God loves us, but I ain't feeling loved right now. <laughs> right? Well, that's the world coming to tempt us, right? Trying to come and point things out to us. Does he really love you? When Becky and I were courting and, and we started dating at that finance company, every single guy in that place wanted Becky. Every single guy. When I started working there, the first week I was there, the, the men would gather at the break and you know what they were talking about? I didn't know who they were talking about at first, but they were talking about Becky. But 
And so when we started dating, when she broke off her engagement with the guy and we started dating, everybody in there wanted her. Keep it. And they were all pursuing her, flirting with her while we were dating. They were trying to convince her that I come behind in some kind of a way, right? So that there could become a distance, so that there could become a chasm, so that they could convince her to give herself over into their arms. And that's kind of what the world does, right? With God. And so what is it that keeps us communing with the love of God or knowing the love of God? What, what it is, 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 is it's much like love letters also, right? Like when Becky and I were dating, I wrote her all these love letters. All, and she wrote me love letters, and I talked about it last week. Thomas got us a bottle of champagne when we finally closed on that house. The first thing we did was we went to our storage, because we'd been living out of storage for four years, and grabbed our boxes of mementos and our pictures. And we went and sat on the floor in the new house with that champagne, looking over all the love letters, reading them. Listen, man, the weight that came alive inside of us as we just sat there remembering, looking into our history, looking into our lives together. There was like a gigantic weight of love and passion that was just like, bam, where we were just like bawling. And we forget how easy it is to forget. You, you go on in life, you can get so distracted. There's so many things going on. You have to work all these hours. You could be working nonstop. You could have all these issues with your kids. You can have issues with each other. You can have, each of you could have individual issues, and a distance can grow. And you forget how easy it is to forget the loving feeling, right? And, man, Becky and I were living with my parents for four years. You think we weren't fighting during those four years, living in that <laughs> little room? I promise you we were. I mean, my poor wife, God bless her. My, she loves my parents. My parents are lovely. But those aren't her parents. In reality, she didn't know them. Now we're up in their house. She's walking on tippy toes. Am I doing it right? Am I getting it right? I'm just in there opening up their fridge, feeding my face. She's feeling like, we can't do that. What are you doing? <laughs> and so listen, man, we, it was hard living in that little room. We didn't have any of our stuff. We didn't even have our clothes. Four years. And so by the time we moved out of that house, listen, a distance had tried to grow, a chasm, and you lost the loving feeling. And when, when the first thing, that must have been the Holy Spirit, the first thing we did, we cracked open those mementos, and I tell you what, the loving feeling was like, bam! We were baptized in it, caught up in it. And you wouldn't think you could forget, because you lived it all. You did it all. But it's so easy to forget, to become distracted, right, where you think it's gone. The newness is worn off. Bye-bye. Right? But just cracking it open. Right? You see, but we have the same kind of thing with God. That's why I keep beating the horse. That it, 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 we, we have to make God personal. We've depersonalized God into just some doctrine that we're just going to remember. But we have a dating history with God. It's about husband and wife. There's a courtship. There's a history. There's love letters. Jesus is God's love letter to us right? He's poured himself out in those letters to us. He's described his love for us, his heart for us. He's told us everything he's done for us. It's all contained in Jesus Christ. And just like Becky and I went and sat in the room and looked into it and we were immersed in the love we feel, that's what happens when we hear the faith that was revealed in Jesus. That's what happens. It stirs us up by way of remembrance right. and it keeps us in the love of God. You're stirring me up as usual. I think uh, if I was trying to explain to someone else who hasn't experienced this group and dynamic, well, what's it like? I would say this, Greg, you have not only taught us what to know, you've taught us how to think. Because that thought, the scripture would say, take every thought captive to Christ. Well, that sounds great, but what does that mean? Exactly. Okay. The foundation to consider a thought you're saying is life in Christ which is eternity, the eternal life. And you're saying, take that thought and think of that thought in that context. That's basically what he's telling you. Look, man, anybody who's had a kid, any father, man, we all struggle. Is there a father here who hasn't struggled with their kids, whether I'm doing it right? Man, you're just, you're normal. You're just like all of us. You, you, you love that child so much, you don't want to mess up. And you have this thought, well, if I mess up, then that child's not going to turn out right. Lie. Okay? We all go through that. I still go through it. Right, Callie? <laughs> <Still down there. laughs> when I was in law school, there was this saying, you got to think like an attorney. 
But there's also a saying that an attorney's mind is sharpened by being made more narrow. Okay. It's just not a compliment. But the thing is, I asked somebody in law school, well, uh, you know, you have to learn all these rules. Well, that's like religion. You have to learn all these rules. And I was told it's not what you know, it's how to think. Well, here we get not only what to know, but how to think. And that's what pretty much what I hear Greg telling us is how to think about this. Yeah. A thought comes to you, you know, how do you think about that thought? And the thing that got me in 1993 that kind of opened me up to even listening to the gospel, because I thought people who wanted to preach the gospel to me was just trying to take away my fun. I mean, I was down on Bourbon Street partying, and there's someone with a blow horn, you know, the megaphone. Oh, so we saying, repent, repent. And I'm like, I mean, I'm not repent. I'm having a good time. <laughs> I didn't know what repent was. Right. But what, what the question that, um, that really changed or made me pause is, well, why do you believe what you believe? That, I never thought about that. Everybody believes something. Hey, right. Why? Why do you believe that? That's another way of approaching this. Like, how would you think about that? Why do you believe that? It's a, you know, uh, the guy with the bullhorn saying repent. Yep, Marie and I, you know, we did our little party. I went to it on Bourbon Street. And, and they used to have these guys that would walk around with crosses, you know. And I mean, I think to myself, you know, I'm a Christian. Why don't I want to walk around Bourbon Street with a cross? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or, you know, go out there with a bullet on every couple. But it's it's kind of interesting because apart from what those folks are doing out in the French Quarter trying to communicate the gospel in the best way they know how, it, it's funny how the Lord in your personal heart can see some of these things and it says something, it speaks something to you. The guy saying repent may not really understand what it even means to repent, but when he says it, that word elicits something within us that when you think it, think of it right, so you hear things like that, and you go home with it, and you, and you, your mind mulls it over, and you think about it. You say, "What does that mean?" And you start communing with God about that thing, and you have Him revealing to you what it means to, to that you could be metamorphosized and changed into his image through faith in his son and you you begin to realize oh if you believe on jesus you've repented and in the life that is found in him comes to you and so your understanding of this guy who may not really understand repentance fully himself saying you gotta quit sinning you gotta quit doing these things it was just about that time that i saw written in concrete on the sidewalk you know before it dries someone writes something trust jesus and I saw that, and it got, yeah. it just, those words just, yeah. sure. to this day, I know exactly where it was. Wow. It's just, that got in me, and it's got to work. Something, in. something was already working in you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, God was. No, that, when you saw that, yeah. it just, like, right. poked it yeah. in, in a way that absolutely. just, bam, right. blew it up inside of me. Absolutely. Right? right? You had already been hearing the voice of the Father, mm. yeah. right? Hadn't really maybe connected. That's what you were hearing. And then, bam, yeah. you were already crying out for a father. You've been crying out for a father from a very young age, is what you did know. Yeah. What's interesting about your, your story, Thomas, your life in the natural, is that at a very young age, you were confronted with, I need a father, right? And had a cry in your heart for a father. Yep. And from that time forward, the Holy Spirit was there, right? Ministering God to you as you were, you know, trying to sort that out. Yeah, same for you. Yeah, it's a powerful thing. So am I doing enough? You're talking about in the scope of being a father? Yes. All right, so we'll go back to that. I don't think it had anything to do with uh, mainly being a father. It didn't really have anything to do with being actually with God. Um, I don't even know why this thought came to my head, but I felt like I wasn't doing enough on this earth. And not in a sense like I need to prove myself that I'm doing all these amazing things and I have God or I'm doing all the amazing things. I'm an amazing person. But I think it just had to do with like um, there is so much to do on this earth and I'm not doing enough. I, I don't really even know the context of where I was going with that. Well, what is there to do? And that's what I go, I go back to the really the only thing for us to do on this earth is to know and love God. That's, I mean, I would kind of go back to that. Is that that's the foundation of us, and then you build from that. Well, God will build from that, right? 
God will draw us into our union with him. He will catch us up into this marriage with him and his life. We'll find ourselves immersed in his presence, immersed in our union with him. Now, out of intimacy, that's what intimacy would be called, right? And well, out of intimacy, we all know what comes forth, free. Even the world knows that. I mean, look at all the birth control we have in the world, right? Well, that's because they know out of intimacy comes forth free, right? <laughs> I mean, and so out of this intimacy will come forth fruit, right? And so something will come forth out of that intimacy. And you could be doing something. Right. But when you when, when again, when you're weighing that thought, am I doing enough in the world? Well, what is it that you think the world needs? Because you're that 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 thought is built on something. That thought isn't the foundation. That thought is born from a certain premise. Right. And the premise would be that the world needs so much. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be able to get to. Am I doing enough? But, right. So you are first seeing the world in the light of it needs so much. Well, what is it that it needs? Right. And, and even in, in sections of Christianity, there's large sects of the Christianity that think that the church is in the earth to reconcile the world back to God or to perfect the world from sin and death, to perfect the world from all the lack and all the things that are wrong, right? And so it's easy to look at the world and think the world is jacked up. And it's easy to be pressed in on by the thought, am I doing enough to help the world? Well, that thought comes about from above. Jesus come and said when they ch you know they chastised Jesus for letting that woman wash his feet with all those perfumes do you know why they did that because you could have sold that for a lot of money and you could have fed the poor you could have really helped them right this isn't to say we, we won't feed the poor or that we won't help the poor but you know so Jesus says something magnificent or I don't I mean it doesn't sound nice but it's profound he says I will only be with you for a small period of time you will always have the poor um, yep. Okay, so Jesus blows up the idea that you could even perfect the earth from poverty. So most all of the thoughts that we might have about what the world needs and what we can do to help the world, none of those thoughts come from God. They all come from the Adam mind that doesn't know what God's done to perfect the earth from sin and death. And so their mind is all the time filled with everything that's wrong and everything that could be done to make it right. And so now their whole life is born from a world's idea of philanthropy or charity or whatever you want to call it, right? But not from God, right? The thing that we want to happen is we want this earth to be reconciled to God. Guess what? Somebody already did that, <laughs> right? And so now from the perspective of God, well, why is the church in the earth? The church is in the earth to be the salt and the light. What that means is, is we understand what it feels like to look at the corruption and think it's not right. We understand to feel like it's unjust. We understand what it feels like to feel the, the lack and the grief and the pain over what we see. And so now we're in the earth declaring to people that God also knows. And he also feels it. And look what he's done. Then, right? To reconcile the earth to himself. And that we now declare the confidence, the boldness, that this earth will be perfected from sin and death. And nothing can keep it from happening. Nothing. And then, in fact, we have the down payment of that inside of ourselves through the incorruptible seed of God dwelling inside of our bodies. And we know the kingdom has already come to the earth. We're not waiting for the kingdom to come to the earth. God sowed the seed of the kingdom in the earth through the blood of Jesus being spilled in the earth. He is the seed. His outer shell died, and he was planted in the earth. And we see what that seed does inside of an earthen vessel because Jesus was in an earthen vessel and we see what the seed did inside of his earthen vessel. Do you see any corruption in his body? Do you see any sin and death in his body? Do you see any lack in his body? Well, that's the, what the seed that was sowed into the earth produced in him. And that tells us what's coming in this earth. And now we're out there declaring the good news about how this whole earth has been redeemed. Mm. Right? And, and that's what the world needs to hear. That's what the, the earth is longing for, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That the, the lamb that removed the sin of the, the world has already come. And so this earth, Paul talked about this earth was made subject to vanity. Creation was made subject to vanity. That means corruption, death by one man, Adam, right? But we see that God has done something through the last man, Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, to redeem that creation from the vanity. Right? And so we don't live as if the corruption or the, the lack is reigning in the earth. And we don't live as if we need to perfect that. We live knowing the truth. Now, out of that, 
we could find something in us where we become like a living sacrifice, right? Where because we've engaged, a living sacrifice is talking about giving yourself over into the arms of God. You notice how that sounds so doctrinal? Present your sapatis. What does that mean? <laughs> it's literally talking about the kind of a thing that would happen when a woman becomes so persuaded in the integrity of a man towards her life that she gives herself over into his arms. She presents her body to him, her whole spirit, soul, and body. She gives it to him, right? Present yourselves a living sacrifice. It's for you to be so persuaded by the integrity of God towards your life that you present your body to him. You give yourself over unto him. And out of that, fruit can come forth, right? And you could find the voice of God coming forth out of you in the earth, right? Being the salt and the light. That's what the earth needs. So we see the earth is jacked up. What does it need? It needs salt and light. That's what it needs, right? Now you have to ask yourself, well, what does it mean to be the salt and the light? And that's the part the church don't like. Because you know when Jesus was the salt and the light? On the cross. On the cross. <laughs> <laughs> till, till, till. till. <laughs> right? And, and you know what Jesus would come and say? I understand the tilt. I felt the tilt in my mortal flesh in Gethsemane. That's when he said, the flesh is weak, the spirit is willing. So if your flesh feels like it doesn't want that, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. <laughs> the flesh isn't going to want that. It's impossible for the flesh to want that. But the spirit is willing. So what you do is you connect to the spirit. That's the faith that was revealed in Jesus. And then that spirit brings forth something in you, right? Where you become a living sacrifice in the earth on account of you having presented your members, your body to God. Right? Because you see what God brings forth in the human body, right? That's presented unto him. You're persuaded by his integrity. Now, through that, you'll be the salt and the light in the earth, right? You'll be declaring what God's done to preserve the earth from death. You'll be declaring what God's done to pour out his life in the earth. In Jesus was life, and the light was the light of all people. His life is the light of all people. You know, how you, do, you know how you glorify the Father? You declare the life he has in himself. And you declare that life even overcomes death in the flesh and has overcome death in the flesh. And now you're in the earth saying that. And you know what could happen? The two human groups that are in the earth fighting about climate, that are in the earth fighting about environment, and all the hell that's happening from that, I don't know if you guys realize it. Every time humans try to perfect the earth from what they decide is wrong, do you know what we do? We bring forth more wars, yep. Yep. more envyings, more backbitings, more calamity. And so do you know what would put that to rest? Is for somebody to come and say, I understand why you care about the earth. Do you know who cares about the earth more than anyone? God. Let me tell you what he's done to preserve or gather this creation unto himself. Right? And you come declaring that. Now these people fighting and warring, oh, their flesh can be put to rest. Right? And that could have a great effect in the earth. That's why the scripture comes and says, blessed are the peacemakers. Right? Well, how do you make peace? We have to first understand why there's warrings and backbitings and envyings and strife amongst the people in the world. Right? It's because of the sting of death. It's because of the lust that comes alive inside of us when we see corruption. And the lust that comes alive inside of us when we see corruption is we know corruption ain't right. And we want life. We know it's not right to lack. Like, we all know that. We know lack ain't right. How many of you felt lack and thought, this is wonderful? <laughs> I've been saying that a lot. But we need to understand ourselves. Why we even get to where we get backed up into the corner. We weren't made for lack. We were made for an abundant life. We were made to feel a well of living water rising up inside of us and just pouring out. That's what we were made for. Guess what? We don't all feel like that all the time, do we? And we don't get there by ourselves. There's external circumstances that come into our sphere and are like, look at me, look at me, dancing around, poking you right between the eyes. But, and you can't not see it. It's there, right? And you could see no evil, hear no evil, think no evil. You could play that game with yourself. I promise you it won't work. You can't pretend you don't see the evil, but what you need to see is what God's done to swallow that evil up inside the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so you understand what you feel when you see that. And then because we're not like, we're not ignorant, like Paul said, of the devices of the serpent, we're also not ignorant of how God comes and puts water on our tongue or how he comes and combats the fiery dart, right? The fiery dart that is against us in the world. 
right? And so from there, I don't think of, am I doing enough? From there, I just present my body to God. And it's not like surrender, like we've been taught in religiosity. But if we could look at, you, you could just have a pure desire to empty yourself. You, you could have that. But the world would want to come and mix with that and get you connected with all this nonsense to corrupt it. Yeah, I mean, it was just on the context of like, I was, uh, I mean, I was making my drive from training that I was doing and I just was driving, minding my own business and it was, and it was just like this, are you doing enough, Joe? Hmm. And I don't even know where that came from. Like, it wasn't even in a context of like, you're doing enough for this or you're doing enough for God, you're doing enough for your family. It was just like, are you doing enough? Terry. Yeah. Well, listen, so then I was like, where did that even come from? I'm going to mess with Joe. The next time you feel like that, call me up. I'll put you to work. Because <laughs> I, I tell you something I never think, am I doing enough? Right. 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 You know the things I think? I don't have enough time to sleep, Lord. <laughs> well, you can call your wife up. and I Right. Stop. My goodness, Marie. <laughs> uh, I, I think what is that? We are going to set an up on appointment with the priest. Yeah. <laughs> with the local with the priest. priest. Yeah. 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 So, I guess to kind of to go back to kind of what you were saying, because uh, there was something that I that I thought was very interesting. I mean, I know we talk about this a lot. Is um, like actions that come about as far as um, you know, actions that somebody might see as being angry or being uh, distraught or stressed. Yeah, a lot of the times is there is a root cause of like you there is a thought that came kind of like I'm not doing enough there was a thought that came to you and you believed on that thought as in you believe that you did lack something you believe that you are fearful of not doing enough for my son or all those thoughts it's like because you believe that little tiny little word or or, or somebody whispering in your ear the moment you believe that it's like I always tell people, what you speak about yourself is who you will become. So if you speak this word, if you believe that you are, <clears throat> that you lack, I don't know, coffee, for the rest of your life, you're going to, you're going to want coffee, coffee, coffee. That's all you're going to think about. So if you believe that you are a horrible person or you're not strong, you, you are a horrible person. You will, you are not strong. Yeah. So it's like if you believe those things that you tell about yourself, you, you're going to become that person whether you like it or not. Well, yeah, out of the ha our heart flow the issues of life. Right. And I know what you mean, but for anybody that will be watching the video, it's not what we speak, it's what we believe. Out of, yes. out of the, yeah. the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah. And so this whole idea that we create our wor world with our words is corrupt. It's actually full of iniquity. It's like a new age thought. We do not create our world with our words. Then what happens is you get into this principle working where you got to watch every word that you speak. Yeah. And you better never have a negative confession. Because if you have a negative confession, what you're doing is you're shaping your life. That's all nonsense, right? You can read in the Psalms, every single Psalm, David, quote unquote, has a negative confession. And do you know what it says about David? That he's a man after God's own heart, right? So it's not what we say out of our mouth. It's what we believe in our heart. And just because we confess out of our mouth the grief we feel or the pain we feel or the confusion we feel, that does not necessarily mean that's what we believe. What it means is that's what we're grappling with. And now if we're grappling with that inside of ourselves, we need to come out with that with the Lord or with a friend that is intimate with the Lord, a, a spiritual person, right? We come out with what we're grappling with. That's why it says to connect to confess your faults to one another Conne confess your faults to one another means to express your weaknesses or the things you're struggling with or grappling with inside of yourself to one another well if i can't ever have a negative confession how am i ever going to express to somebody else what i'm going through and what's going on right the scripture doesn't say to judge your brother for their struggles and go and tell other people about them <laughs> and not sit and backbite about them it doesn't say that right that's why Something you learn along the way is you want to be certain who you're talking with yeah. is actually spiritual and isn't functioning from that place, yeah. right? And if they are and you do it anyway, well, the Lord just specializes in raising up the freaking dead, <laughs> that he will raise you up in the midst of that, yeah. right? But that's, that's what that's talking about, right? We can grapple with things and we grapple with God and also we grapple with people we know to have wise counsel. Right, Maurice keeps talking about the white fear, so I might have to re remove Maurice from the, the list of wise counsel. <laughs> no, we know. That's only when you got the perfect wife. That's why I'm joking <laughs> with you. 
relate to that. But <laughs> uh, the scripture is, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So that's another one. Yeah. I almost called Greg up yesterday. I was driving across Causeway to a family gathering, which I was kind of dreading. And because uh, uh, I'm not going to go into it, but I was dreading it. <clears throat> and I thought, well, if I call Greg up, he's just going to say this, that, and that, which he just said. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, there's no need to call. Because <laughs> I, already, I already had a conversation in my head with Greg that made me at ease to go into this uncomfortable situation. So. Hallelujah. And that's, yeah. that's why we preach the faith. As ministers, we're not supposed to tell people what to do. Like, we're not here to tell people what to do. Yeah. What we're here to do is to Truth. preach the spirit that's in the scriptures amongst everyone, everywhere we go, right? That until Christ be fully formed in them. That, that's what we do. And so we just declare what the scriptures say, and then the people engage with the scriptures, they engage with God. They hear the voice of God. They start connecting with God, right? That doesn't mean you never, like, come in and counsel people because somebody could find themselves in a situation where they need not to be confronted like the world would talk about being confronted, but they need, like, a help. Hey, are you okay? Right? It's so easy for this to happen to all, any of us. You know, it, right? it, it's, it's interesting how uh, we are like responders to everything. Everything that we see in the world, and we, we just naturally respond to things. And you know, it's like taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Well, what happens is we see things that are not right in the world and we want to fix it. We want to do to, to get the things right, you know? But when you see that thing that is eliciting something in you you look up to to the one who has perfected your life who's given you the perfect life who has justified you before him in love in whom you have a perfect relationship because the one who is in you is perfect and and he has given you everything that you need for life and godliness when you see that thing out there it instead of go, looking this way how am i going to fix that you look up and to the one who has fixed everything for you and all of a sudden it puts you to rest and you begin to actually respond to that in a proper manner you you, you because you know that what's happening out there is is beyond its control and beyond your control and you just begin to relate to the 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 people and the situations in your life based on the fact that you have been healed mm -hmm. so why do we react what causes us to react to our external i feel you're feeling out of control yeah feeling like you can't do anything about it yeah. and judgment what makes us feel that though it's, we feel it's a threat to life i would judge it as something negative yep yeah yep something contrary to life Contrary to life, right? yes, all those things are true, and then w we want to build out another bridge there. Because even if I judge something contrary to life, what does that necessarily have to do with me? Like, why do I immediately filter it through myself and my own existence and my own be my own being? Right? Mm -hmm. Why? Why does that dynamic exist? So Maurice uses the word we react to the things around us. Well, that's absolutely true. It's actually a function of human design. And so we want to ask ourselves, why? To, is, is it that way? Right? We weren't designed to know death and to know lack. We, we weren't designed to know death or no lack. Exactly. But why aren't we able to say, you know what? That death got nothing to do with me. You ever notice how we filter it through ourselves in our own life? Like... In real time, like on the freaking spot, that's why we get to what you're talking about. The fear, the out of control, all those different kinds of things. And then we feel very stressed out. Listen, the scripture says that we're made in the image of God. The scripture also calls us an earthen vessel. Do you, you know what an earthen vessel talks about? It talks about, this messes people up because we only think of idolatry. It talks about an idol. Yeah. Man was made to be an image bearer. We were made to behold something, and in what we behold, it becomes born out of us, right? So we were made to bear something, and we're made to bear what it is we see. And what happens is, is when we see corruption and we see things in the earth, that it can animate us. 
like immediately like that's what we're bearing we see the death and that death can be magnified inside of our hearts right like we start reflecting the image of death we start bearing about the image of death or we think we're bearing about the image of death because that's what we see like that's the likeness that is in us and to Maurice's point that's why when you connect with God you're meant to bear the likeness of God right you're meant for something to animate you and so what happens because we have listen you guys don't even need to understand that that's just happening that's just happening we know that we're made to be animated by things and so we're constantly interacting with the world around us from that perspective even if we don't even know it and that's why we can be so upset when we see what we see because we don't just see it over there we see it as animating our lives we see that as being the likeness of what we're bearing right and he used to say many, many, many times, Jesus is the only true word about your lives. Remember that? Yeah. I mean, like, and that got in me. And that, that, that's, that's a good way of thinking about whatever thought it is. Because if it's not true about Jesus, then it can't be true about us. Soon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like we're meant to be a, a we receive. Oop. And we receive what it is we behold. And we're meant to behold God. Right? And in beholding God, then his likeness animates our being. Right? But we're in a world that has gotten shrouded or veiled in darkness. And so what ends up happening is we behold the darkness instead of beholding God. Whatever it is you're beholding, that's what's going to animate you because you're an image bearer. You're made to bear in yourself something's image. Right? And so that's why Jesus come and talk about being singled eye. He can come talking about your treasure being in heaven or in earth talked about your treasure being in heaven where moth and rust can't corrupt he talked about if your treasure was in the earth then how great will the darkness be that animates you he says because he understands humans are a vessel and we're going to bear the image of something and the image we're going to bear is that which we behold and so if we're beholding all the darkness in the earth all the corruption in the earth all the things that are wrong in the earth all the the death that's in the earth all the lack that's in the earth guess what we're going to be animated by All of that. Yeah. Right? But if we can have our eyes fixed on, that's why Paul said, set your affection on high, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You can have your eyes fixed there. Single eye. That's what he's talking about. If your treasure is in God, if your treasure is in his life, that you're in him and he's in you, that's where Jesus' treasure was, even when he was in the midst of the death of the cross. And what is the likeness that he ended up bearing? Look at the resurrection. Right? What did he see? The glory set before him. Right? And so God has set before us the same glory in the resurrected Jesus Christ. Right? And we see that glory was set before Jesus even while he was dead on the cross. He had eyes to see that. Now we have the same spirit that caused Jesus to see the Father's face shining. We see that shining and that starts bearing the likeness of God in us as we walk in a world shadowed by death. But what is it you see? What do you see? I love what God does to Ezekiel. Son of man, what do you see? Mm. And do you know what he saw? Dead bones. And bones. And he, son of man, can these bones live? Oh, yeah. Thou knowest, Lord. <laughs> right? And then what does he tell him to do? Speak to those bones, son of man. Right? And so you can walk out of here talking with God about what do you see? What do you see in your life that you think hurts you? What do you see in your life that you think is a stumbling block? That you think is not right? That you think is crooked? Whatever word you want to use. What is it that you see that is that way? And you want to start talking with God about, Lord, has my eye gotten fixed on that? Is that animating me? Maybe you need comfort. Maybe you need strength. Maybe you need peace. Maybe you need joy. Maybe you need love. Maybe you need a sound mind. There could be a million different things that you need. But just walk out of here talking with God about what do you see. Hear the voice of the Lord asking you, son of man, what do you see? Right? And recognize that you're, a, you're an image bearer. And whatever it is you're beholding is what's going to animate you. That's why God entered into death, because we were beholding the death, 
and the death was the only thing we could see, and then that was animating our lives. And so what he said is, I gotta manifest something in the middle of the death that's more powerful than the death that can cast the death down from their sight, and it can become the thing that they see so that they can now bear the likeness of that. That's what the resurrection is about. He come and disrespected death in our midst because our eye got fixed on this great death. All the lack, the world, everything wrong. Well, he comes and disrespects that death right in our midst so we can be like, wait a second, what's that? <laughs> and we could start beholding that, a life that even overcomes death, a life that has so much strength in it that even when you feel weak, you can keep going, a life that gives you a sound mind, a life that gives you peace and love and joy. Because as you behold that life, you'll start bearing about in your body the likeness of that life. And there's no way around it. You're going to be an image bearer. You can't stop being a human. You're not going to become E.T. You're not going to say, I don't want to be an image bearer. And I want to be an alien. So I'm not an image bearer. You can't get around it. You are an image bearer. The question is, what are you beholding? What do you see? Because you are animating that thing. Your body is meant to animate something. Right? And so if you think you've gotten fixated on something other than life, there's good news for you. God's poured out his Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. And so you don't have to feel bad about it. You don't have to feel distraught. If you find yourself in that place, what you start talking with God about is the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Right? And start talking to the Holy Spirit, praying with the Holy Spirit about fixing your eye on the Father's life, fixing your eye on the life that manifested in the resurrection. Right? You can talk to the Holy Spirit about how you've gotten sidetracked with this and that and the other and the weight and the stress. Right? And your desire for life has, has become such a heavy burden that you're dealing with it this way and that way and the other way. Right? And you could talk to the Holy Spirit. What did you see? Hmm. Right? Yeah, when you're looking at your life in the world, too, it, it's such a roller coaster feeling. It's, it's like when you're beholding some, when everything's going well, it's like, oh, this is great. You know? <laughs> like, it changes your mood when you're like, Oh, I have exciting plans this weekend, you know, whatever it is. But then it's so unstable. Yeah. It's not us. The language we've used in the past is beholding your life in the world. And I've told everybody, do not behold your, your life is not hid in the world. That's what the perfect law of liberty was, how God got it right to liberate your life from being born of the world. And he's begotten you again from the word of truth or the incorruptible seed of Jesus. Right? The reason we, we went into all of that is because we're going to magnify wherever we behold in our life. And that's why, if you think things it's are going so good. Like, and it's so slippery. It's so deceiving. Yeah. Because those things aren't bad. I just have sons. Yep. It's good to have goals and work towards things. But when you're so focused on that, you can feel that road to start back to. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to see, or you have the one thing that can really ground you no matter what. Yeah. What do you see? Like we talked. Where are you, Greg? Where are you? Who told you? What do you see? Let that be added into the voice of God to you. What do you see? <laughs> right? And and let him show you what he sees. Like for me, I everything I do is for the purpose of the body of Christ coming into the unity of the faith. Like I empty myself for people to know God and for the body of Christ to come into the unity of faith. Do you guys think I see the body of Christ come into the unity of faith? Not yet. No. You think we're even close to seeing that? No. I'm just being honest. Sometimes that affects me beyond just grief. I feel the grief because I know it's not right. But then there's times where it's trying to get on my shoulders, yeah. right? Where I'm trying to carry a burden. I've heard God say, Greg, what do you see? Right. And, 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 what, and I'm just honest. What I see is the body being abused all the time. What I see the body is being led off into lust, destruction, darkness, pain, hatred, and it hurts me. Right. And then you know what God says? Greg, what do you see in Jesus? Because he is the body. We're members of his body. And do you know what I see in Jesus's body? Everything crooked, made straight, no spots and blemishes, no lack everything in perfect union right and so that that's just an example in my personal life how it can happen what do you see right and where the spirit would try and take you back to because when i see the body 
inside of Jesus, do you know what I feel? But when I see the body in the earth, do you know what I feel? Lord, help us. Will we ever? Will you find faith in the earth when you come into the earth? Seriously. <laughs> That's how you feel. It, that, so what is it? Do you see how I'm bearing the image of what I see? And how that's why we preach Jesus, right? That's why we don't walk after the flesh. That's why we don't judge our life based on what we see in our flesh. We can acknowledge if something's not born from life, but we don't judge ourselves by that. We judge ourselves by our union with God through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And we start connecting with that. Maurice, I was just kind of reading here in Psalm 25, it says, uh, lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. And I looked up that word wait, and because we think wait means wait on him and everything's going to be okay if I wait long enough. You know? But it says to bind together, perhaps by twisting, that is to collect or to expect, to gather together, to look patiently, to tarry and to wait upon, uh, to wait for and upon that thing. And when you think about that, that word, it's like you are just sitting there collecting the goodness of God into you, waiting for him to help you to see, help you to understand, and, and, and to strengthen you. So it, it's not like this, like you're waiting for something. It is, it's in that weight that you actually feel yourself gathering together and twisting together with the Lord to overcome everything that you see in life that is, seems amiss to you. So it's time is the theme, right? It's the, yeah. the weight isn't talking about time. The weight is you see yourself yes. braided together with God. Yes. That fills you with patience because you know that union you have with God is sorting everything out. Yes. Like you behold yourself in God and you behold God in you. That's what Jesus beheld on the cross. Right. And do you know what he ended up being the image bearer of? The file. Yeah. Right? The glory of God was manifested in him. Animated in him. Yeah. Right? An earthen vessel. Does that make any sense? No. Well, if it doesn't, go back and listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> and... YouTube has this wonderful thing where you can slow it down. Yeah. You can put it on 0.5. I speed it up to two. Like, I listen to myself on two times. I can only get it one and a half. I can't keep up with it. <laughs> yes, but I'm the one that says it, so it's easier for me. You probably sound like maybe Miles at that speed. Yeah, but next week, maybe we'll, we'll go wherever the Spirit leads, but maybe next week we'll talk about um, what it means to have a pure heart and what that looks like, right? Cool. Thank you.